welcome and welcome to an unusual surprise for all of us. What a delight it is to gather with you to explore the art of Paul Caponegro with the artist, with the exhibition curator, our dear friend, Rusty Herbert. The surprise part is that we're actually in the gallery space together in separate rooms. And it's a delight to welcome Paul to his exhibition and an opportunity to share his magical work with that of Brother Thomas. A little background as to how we arrived here today. More than a decade ago, we were vacationing in Maine with Rusty and he asked if we'd be open to visiting with an artist whose work he had recently acquired. We said yes. Rusty, as an IVF physician, now retired, had focused a portion of his collecting photographs of photographs of whole eggs. He managed to acquire a photograph from the main based photographer, Paul Caponegro. And our gallery had, over its close to 44 years then, shown some photography of photographs like Tony King, Paul Kerry Goldberg, Kerry Walensky, Bill Aaron, and Fran Foreman. Each of these artists had their distinctive voice. But I must say that when I saw Paul's work, I was absolutely stunned and delighted. And Thomas's words come to mind in a very special way. Skill and art are not the same thing. The only real measurement of art is astonishment. And I think that that's what both Sue and I felt when we saw Paul's work. So we asked Paul if he'd be open to the possibility of an exhibition at the gallery. With no real date in mind, he responded by saying, well, I was born in Revere, so why not? And that was the beginning of a more than 10 year journey together which has turned out to be five amazing exhibitions of extraordinary work. We're especially grateful to Rusty for his having gone up and visited with Paul and curated this exhibition very carefully in a way that presents art that Paul has created that even those people who followed his work over many, many decades were delighted to see and received a new insight into the work that was exhibited here in conjunction with Thomas's pieces. So the intention today is really to just share both stories, responses, and ideas about the works. And the show perfectly is entitled, Seeing With My Heart. So the notion of being able to engage with these two men about the art itself and about those issues and opportunities that the art itself provides, bring to mind a couple of quotes of Thomas's. First, art is only a means when there's something interior to share. When there is not, it is not art, it's just another thing. And I think this exhibition specifically addresses that in quite a wonderful way. He also wrote, we are all born with creativity because we are born with the unquenchable thirst for the beautiful. And each of the images in this show, and it's been one of the delights to have it here, is to see people engaged in looking and seeing carefully. There are some statistics that say that most people who visit museums stand for three seconds at a maximum in front of a work of art. And I can say to you, Paul, very seriously, the people have spent up to a minute to two minutes looking at some of the pieces in the show and feeling, I think, very uplifted and satisfying. So with that in mind, I'm happy to ask Rose to share with us a couple of images, which I will talk about a bit, invite both Paul and Rusty to participate in any responses that they may have, just with the caveat that this is an X-rated show. Certainly one of my favorites and it has always been as part of the gallery's opportunity to show Paul's work. The notion of both the abstract quality of this particular piece evokes so many responses emotionally and I think spiritually to the beauty that nature offers us, but also the invitation 
for our imagination to explore it. Paul, this goes back to 1958. And if you would bring us up to date in your life to 1958, we'd love to hear it. Ooh, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> maybe, maybe we should go back to the time that I was first introduced to the dog. And that is when my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, would line up the children at family events and hop at us with a, a brownie box camera. And I was intrigued. I must have been five years old, maybe four. And I wanted to know what was that that she was doing. She explained it to me. She told me how it worked and guided me in making a picture. So that's where my first photographic name with the instruction of grandma. And uh, she then sent them to the, the drugstore to process the prints and then show them to the family. My, I thought that was good. Right. And I was not much of a student in school. I was much more interested in nature. Couldn't wait for the bell to ring, leave the school yard, and go to nature. Mostly the ocean. I lived in uh, Revere, Minnesota. While on these forays into nature, the ocean or the woods, it occurred to me that maybe I too could get a camera and take photographs of what I like. Back to the drugstore, get some prints made, and share them with my friends. So that's where it really all started. By the age of 12, I finally managed to get a camera. Now, running to the drugstore to get my twins made, which was at a quarter, did not satisfy. So that was the age at which I thought, I have to learn to develop my own picture. Checked into the photo supply shops. There was one in my hometown. Bought the chemistry, bought the paper, used my mother's Pyrex business as a um, trade, set up in the cellar when it was dark, and I started painting my own paper. By the age of 15, I had to have a better camera. I needed to know more about the stuff. It was the local high school, three year high school. When I get out of school, there was a portrait studio around the corner from there. I walked in and asked them if I could hang out. I'll go for your coffee, I'll buy the hamburger, I'll bring them back. Just let me hang out in the studio and see what you do. So that was allowed. I watched them make portraits. Eventually, they allowed me in the dark room and under these red amber lights. I watched the print come out of nowhere. These images emerge in solutions in the trade. That's a pretty good beginning. And I thought, I need a better camera yet. They have a camera sitting in the corner of their studio. It was a four by five new camera. It wasn't being used, and I asked them to sell it to me. I said, well, we'll give it to me. But there's no lens. You have to buy a lens and a tripod. By the time I got out of high school, I was actively photographing nature from my heart. I love nature so much. With a very professional camera. And I would share these images with my professional photographers, the Strauss and the very good beginning. Fabulous. I think um, my getting to know Paul, first of all, Paul was an honor. Um, I admire your work incredibly and, and the opportunity to get to know you and, and learn more about how things started was really a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, I know that part of your journey was photography through the Army, up to working with Minor White and uh, a number of different folks. But 
there was a parallel journey you went on in, in music. And uh, I just want to let folks know, um, Paul is an accomplished pianist. He was actually torn early in life. Uh, would he become a photographer or a pianist? I think it was your uncle, Paul, who was a, a person who, who had played piano and you thought perhaps you would go that route. And I'm going to let you s say just one or two words about that, but I, I want to bring it up because I think, as you yourself have said, part of what your photography involves is somehow a combination of what music brought to you as well. And, and it's, I think it's that imbuing of your photographs with a sense of, of the musical, if, if you will, it is a valuable tool. I, uh, I met photography at the age of maybe four, four or five. At the age of three, I met music. Uh, being kept home from kindergarten one morning, not feeling well, the radio was being played for the household. Usually it was the popular music of the day, but suddenly something I would have described as much later as symphonic poured through that radio. And it struck me so strongly that I literally wept. I had discerned that this was something they called classical music, the other was the popular music of the day. But the power of that symphonic music striking me then opened the realm of music for me. I had an uncle who played the piano, popular piano of the day, and wrote songs, but he eventually went to the New England Conservatory of Music and took a degree in concert piano. I had to hang out with him quite a bit and visit him after, after school and his home, which was near mine. So I listened to him practice. I understood what it meant to have to work that hard. The reward was powerful sounds coming into my being. I wanted to be a pianist. At the age of 12, I got my first camera and I had my first piano lessons. And the two of them ran neck and neck all through my high school career. At which point, my dad wanted to know, what the hell are you going to be when you grow up? And I thought, I think I want to be a pianist. So they enrolled me in the Boston University of College of And I lasted maybe two semesters there. I didn't have the academic record really to be working in a, in a university. Just didn't have it. But they allowed me into the music school. That I did. I took piano lessons with a Russian pianist in the two market. But I also listened carefully to a lot of the young students who were working in and around with me, particularly the, the music uh, the practice rooms, 40, 50 rooms, all close together. You could hear pianos going, voices singing, violins, tweaking. Well, it appeared that the people I wanted to talk to, the young students, were the ones that played the that. And I would approach them and find out, like, what exactly? I said, well, it's our teacher. All the good men have had the same teacher. And I got to meet this teacher. And I discovered that he used to come in to the practice room, pick our student out of his music or his practice room, take him and give him an impromptu lesson. So I identified the man. And one day I thought, Got to meet him. He came through the practice room, didn't find a student to work with, walked out of the practice room. I jumped up and ran after him. Mr. Von de Carl, yes, yes, who are you? My name is Paul, and I know you are students, so and so and so and so. Yes, so what? I'm, but I want to study with you. He said, Don't you have a teacher? 
and Mr. Jamarki was studying with Jamarki. I said, well, the way your students work and not, I have too many students. I can't take you now. I said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. You see, I've quit the university, taken the day job, and he's only one. Yes, I've quit the university. Well, now, that shows the intelligence. <laughs> you come to my studio, and let's find out what's going on. I was invited to the studio, play for me. I played. Okay. Now, man, you are a mess. I said, I understand that. That's why I'm coming to you. He said, well, I won't take you unless you agree not to play the piano for one full year. What? He said, you don't understand. You have so many bad habits in your fingers from previous teachers. And unless you stop playing, they're going to go deeper in and you'll never have a chance. Stop now. Let me retrain your hands. And you might have a chance to be a decent man. <laughs> Sorry. I agree. One full year, two lessons a week, 10 minutes each, a bit, and since everybody else gets at least half an hour lesson, four hour lesson, I only get 10 minutes. You silly boy. Don't you understand? I'm working your fingers. These kids have to produce programs for their graduation that they're not ready for. You don't have to suffer that. Stay with me. Let's work with hands. You'll be ready. One full year, I did not play music. I did the exercises he taught me. Walked in one day, he said, so he had two boys did that. He rustled over his cabinet, brought back a piece of sheet music, threw it on the piano, and said, What do you say with Macy you think now? With a Chopin impromptu. I said, I can play that. He said, Your thing is already. Let's move me. Fabulous. So, Bernie. The, in terms of the photograph we're looking at, the Rock Wall, Connecticut, Paul, do you remember this photograph? I do. In 1958, so it was a, a little while ago. Um, if you can help us a little bit with the concept of, there are two aspects, obviously, to photography. There's the taking of a picture, and then there's the printing of a picture. Uh, starting with the initial the concept of framing something. Um, when you look at what this is, or when you looked at it, what what were where were you where were you in the process of thinking about a, a completed print? Um, do you do you see what you may end up printing, or do you take a a, a picture and then work with it? You need technique to produce anything worthwhile. Studying the Ansel Adams zone system is very helpful. And as you know, if you make a negative, then we'll print well. How well, and specifically, what tonality it will turn out, you really don't know until you start printing it. So you need to know how to make a piece of negative, and then you play with the prints until one of the prints says, yeah, this is the one to it. So having an idea beforehand, uh, the Angel Adams system of the plan photography says you should be able to pre-visualize your prints. I don't believe that. I didn't believe it was true. There were too many variables that came into the process before you could decide exactly what it costs. It's while you're in the printing career that something rises out of the development that tells you now. Maybe we should look at the next photograph. This, oh, oh, by the way, uh, the photo historian looked at that rock wall photograph and said, uh, oh, I know what you got back. 
That's Duchamp, new descending a staircase. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know that it is. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> yes, Clear, clearly in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> Let's look, Rose, at the next image, and let me just uh, share a couple of thoughts about it. Also, from an early time, the 19, 1960, but it also has played a role in the installation of the exhibition um, in a quite wonderful way, occasionally in the context of installing shows after about 25 years, we realized that showing two and three dimensional work at the same time could make uh, both works look a bit stronger and somewhat differently than if they were just shown alone. And this particular exhibition of, of wedding Paul's work with Brother Thomas's has provided us with some wonderful coincidences, if you will. And the next photograph was um, just to share the Brother Thomas work that is situated next to it, uh, uh, a vase with a textural surface that's very similar to the hoarfrost shown in this picture. So if we can look at that photograph, it would be great, or that image, just for a second, and then go back to Paul's image. The textural surface, both of the photograph itself and then the Brother Thomas, is really quite extraordinary. And I think for all visitors who've been through the present exhibition, it's been a wonderful opportunity to engage with both artists' works in a somewhat um, enhanced way than virtually any other exhibition that we've had over many, many years. But Paul, if you could talk just a wee bit about this photograph and your approach to it, what makes it, from my perspective, a rather special way of creating rhythm visually uh, would be very helpful. Well, the fact is, unless you have a sense of rhythm within yourself, and I think everybody does, you wouldn't recognize it out there. So you're attaching your sense of rhythm to, to a world that presents rhythms to us. So I simply made a selection of the lines and crystals that created the rhythms if they were present. <laughs> What was extraordinary about this was the dark tree in the background sky. The wonderful live growing and those overlaying crystals. Okay. The wonderful thing to wake up to first thing in the morning. Didn't even have a cup of coffee. Grab my camera and straight to make my photo. It really is quite a, 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 a interesting and both, both beautiful and sort of, again, with so many of these photographs, a very emotional presentation. There's emotion in this photograph. Uh, it's not about crystals and it's not just about trees. It's about some combination that reaches in to the people that are open to it and touches a special place. It touched Bernie, obviously. And I think Thomas's work had the same capability uh, and to put them juxtaposed, as you've just done, you know, it is, a, is a wonderful display of that. So uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful image uh, of, of, of combinations. And Paul, much of your, your works, and we're going to see more of them, are what I, when I describe wines that I like as being complex, it's because they have multiple layers, maybe. But your photographs have multiple layers. They're, they're, you, you go into those photographs and it, each one has its own sort of emotional level. I mean, you, you see something like these crystals and then the trees behind them and, and the combination of those things uh, takes you to a different place, much different than a, a simple, you know, two dimensional uh, picture of some sort. There's a third dimension to it by, uh, in a way that's it's very unique, I think. That's, it's well, as I said in the beginning, it was nature First, I met the camera, but it was nature that got me to start photographing. And it's the love of nature that enlivens my own emotional system and enables me to see the potential of images like this. 
take a little practice to make a few photographs, good ones and bad ones, to decide which ones work compositionally, which ones textually. But it's the love of nature that enlivened my emotions to eventually enable me to put emotion into my face. Just look at the next. Sorry, well, before we go there, because I, this is a perfect moment to reemphasize the title of the exhibition, which is Seeing With My Heart, and to indicate that most of us assume that we see with our eyes, and sometimes we actually see what we're looking at. But the in invitation of all these works, I think, as Rusty has pointed out as well, and Paul certainly has, is the notion of being able to see with our heart in the sense that we are seeing both spiritually and emotionally that which is being offered to us. And then it really makes it possible to look at the next photograph, which takes us to an entirely different place mm -hmm. in quite a wonderful way. Um, I think many of you know my great affection for Japan and Izumo Taisha, the great um, Shinto temple in the mountains is made of huge, huge trees. And this is, a small, small detail of carved wood there that resonates, for me at least, with the waves of nature, with the beauty of nature, with wind. And I'm guessing that the image itself, not the photograph, but the image that creates this photograph is probably no more than two to 10 inches across. And yet it suggests because of the way you both selected it and chosen it, Paul, and then printed it, an entire universe of beauty. The artist's sensitivity here, first, he recognized the beauty of the patterns, textures in the wood itself, and then added some carving to the wood of its own, which reflected that movement and feeling. So it was the Japanese artist's own sensitivity to nature that uh, I recognized and decided I need to photograph that. Was, was this a single piece, Paul, uh, in, a, in a building or what was this? Yeah, it was a, it was a part of a small building within the, uh, within the shrine itself. They stored uh, various objects in this little building. It's no, no bigger than the size of the room that I'm in. They kept pieces of wood and objects and with a place for storage, which was the outside wall. So I, I would point out, and we'll see this again and again, but the amount of motion in this photograph um, it, it is remarkable. It's following the grains of wood, as Paul said, but the grains of the wood, the carving, the amount of, of movement in this simple photograph is remarkable. Is, is that a sense you had as you were capturing this image, Paul? Oh, absolutely. That's what drew me to it. Yeah. All that life moving, let yeah. me add it. It and brought me to the Japanese sensibility as well. They have a very strong. It, it, it's just for again back to what I said before. This is really just breathtaking, and I've been to this temple, which is overwhelming in size and scale. And to realize that simply by isolating this detail, you captured the entire feeling of the larger structure, with only the reference to the small space, because it feels like nature, in a sense, unbound, and the waves flowing. There's a whole universe that you um, discovered and then shared in this particular image. So thank you. What I want to do is look at the next one because it takes us to a whole different place. And again, um, I sometimes get a little bit concerned when I say this is my favorite photograph because it reminds me much of Anita Sherwood who worked with us for some 37 years. And you would stand in front of any work of art and, say, and this is my favorite one. <laughs> but this is one of my favorite pieces. Uh, we've shown it a number of times over the years, Paul. And just for you to speak about it, for me, it speaks of uh, Paul Clay, actually, in, in a quite wonderful and uh, resonant way. And I'm sure he doesn't even know about it. 
<laughs> Mr. Mr. Clay doesn't. <laughs> right, right. I was aware of his work. I wasn't aware of anything except beautiful shapes in a river that was frozen. But when I got it back to the dark room, started printing it, and made that print, I thought, how did Paul Clay get in there? <laughs> right. <laughs> there, there he is. That's very much a, the way Paul Clay would construct an image of one of your images. You see that little eye up there, up in the upper section. He's got a. It's an absolute, absolute extreme. Rusty, I don't know how you respond to this piece, but as I said, you, it really is one of my all time favorite images. It is also one of my favorite images as well. I think it's a fabulous image, and, and certainly Paul Clay is resonant throughout it. Um, I, let me ask just one more time, Paul, to um, you work in, a, in the 4 by 5 format camera for most of these photographs, if not all of them. Most. And, yeah, and as you took this picture uh, when you were at the Riverside, um, and then you brought it back to the dark room. What, if anything, have you did you do to create the image that we're looking at? Because I know you do do some dodging and some burning things that happen in the dark room, and you're a master at that. And I, I just want people who are listening to us to hear a little bit about how you work in the dark room, because I think that's a unique thing that many not photographers now don't don't print their own prints, and you do everything in the dark room. So. What, for this particular print, anything unique in the dark room? Well, number one, I'm at a river. It's winter. This is ice. It's cold. So I have an impression of ice. The depth of the tone of the print, I want to reflect that this is cold ice. Secondly, the 4x5 camera is a rather almost square form. I needed to crop the negative to the point where Paul Clay would show through. There was too much, too much of the uh, other shapes of ice that didn't contribute to the isolation of that wonderful Paul Clay thing. So cropping is often. But I feel the tonalities or what potential tonalities might come through the subject. Ice, tree bark, cloud, earth. That is carried back. And I try to find in the developer and the silvery emotion a tone, a depth of tone that will reflect that feeling. And are you able to Sorry. are you able to manipulate that? In any way, I mean, to, 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 to bring it out the way you want, they're, they're, those tools are accessible through the, the printing process? Having studied its own system and taken it apart, yes, to almost reinvent it because I thought it was much too technical. I have enough ability to get results that will very, very much satisfy most artists. But there are more than often uh, times that a print shows up that I had not intended that, just, that uh, illustrated other textures, other feelings. And I thought, well, that's better than what I thought. I'm not going to let that go. So if I were pre-visualizing something, brought it back to the dark room, made my print, and wasn't unhappy, it wasn't happy. Further work with it, I think it really wants to do it that way. But I very often get a surprise in the developer of an image that presented itself. It doesn't always have to be under my domination. Technique and ability, wonderful, but I put a soft pedal on it. I don't insist so that my heart isn't closed off to other possibilities. You spoke uh, with us briefly uh, before about 
Ansel Adams having developed the, the zone system in a very, very technical way, and then Minor White, White having tried to make it approachable for folks that don't have that technical expertise. But then you mentioned what I think is so critical about your work, and, and you're touching on it now, and that is an emotional part to your work. Music, the concept of how music works in your brain somehow got infused into your photography process. Could you share that just a little bit with the folks that are listening? The photography process will work into your brain, unfortunately, all too often because it's weighed down with too many facts, too much density, too much exposure, too much this, this, this. It's the release from all of that to be free enough to see another possibility through, I would say, through hearing it. My music allows, I mean, sound comes through my ear and I wish it to go straight to my heart. That's from where I want to make a response or make something of it. I use that sound principle for when the light comes through my eyes, it has a problem bypassing the brain before it gets to the heart. So I have to work to allow the light not to go straight to the intellect, but down to the heart where the real decision will be made. So in a sense, I'm using sound for trying to see my tonal values of light as a sound, so that they both meet in the heart. Yes. Beautiful. Very beautiful. I, I think I remember, I think I remember you once saying something about minor not being open to that that level of getting to the heart. His was more. His stopped at the brain and was more technical. And <laughs> you had a conversation with him about that. Well, you no, know, minors. Minor was more emotional because he had emotional problems, and he recognized that what he saw and photographed reflected what he himself was not only thinking but feeling. So Minor was very much open to the psychological process of recognizing that, well, the best way to say it is, as he said, you photograph a thing for what it is and for what else it is. And it's this what else it is that enables one to make a beautiful print, to transcend to something. Yeah. Or, or get a psychological insight about yourself. So then help me with the next photograph that we're going to be looking at, because as opposed to going out into nature and seeing with your camera and then with your heart, the next image is a still life done in 1999 which respects, it seems to me, the format you described before of the camera itself, but also that you're an active player in both the selection of the objects, the placement of them, and then eventually the presentation of them. Back in the late, uh, mid to late 90s, I had to have both my knees replaced. Mm. I went through a period where I couldn't get out into the field with a heavy tripod and camera. But I was always collecting from nature sticks, stones, bones, feathers, all manner, and it decorated my house. So I thought, I can't get out there, but I can assemble what I brought from nature in such a way as to make a photograph, so called still life. So these are objects that surrounded me in my home. And I thought, it's going to be difficult to make a still my photograph to respond to it because it's, it's almost stilted in that you are arranging it. So I had to be very much aware of what I was arranging and how I was arranging it. But it was brilliant to take those seedlings, with white seedlings, with, with a mere breath, 
would fly off in, in the distance. I had to be very, very quiet. I had to stop breathing when I made the explosion. I think I had to fly off the thing. But I was very conscious that making still lives could too often be still. And I had to watch very carefully in the rain. I'd rain something in the morning. I'd wait till later in the day to look at it again and see if I put too much in. Is there nothing? It's a good period of making. 1999, I started making still lives in the rain. There is, and I, the advantage for me of being able to see it singly on the screen is to virtually see every little small detail of it. That one, if you're in the gallery, you can also come up close to the photograph. But it really keeps everything off to the side and allows us to focus on all of the rhythm that is in it. So there is an absolute joy, both in seeing it now and sharing it with others, through technology, and at the same time, an invitation to those who are able to come by the gallery and look at the photograph in person. Beautiful details. Can we move to the next photo? Sorry. Just beautiful details from nature. Hopefully, well arranged. There, there, it should be noted, there are, Paul's done a number of these types of photographs, composites, all of them uniquely different in terms of composition, what's in them. Um, and similar in some ways, all of them, however, having a power to really pull you in. I mean, there seems to be in many still life paintings, obviously, can be very simple. Um, some are more complex, but some can be quite simple. Uh, and, and some have an ability to engage you and others don't. Paul's still lives, if we call them as such, um, have a, a unique ability to pull you into the photograph. It's almost as though you, you look at it and you say, oh, look at that mat. And then you say, look a little closer and you see the shell because it stands out, obviously. And then as Paul mentioned, the seed thistles that are there are incredibly delicate and could be, <laughs> he's, he's confirmed, they could be blown away very easily if you were to breathe on them. And that process somehow, Paul just really engages one and it is, it is a joy to see five or six of these together, to see that they're each their, their own unique composition, but each, to your credit, does create this, this intensity of, of observation, which, uh, again, takes you to a very special place, a very, very unique place. And I had such fun doing them. <laughs> I'll, I I'll loved it, in fact. I loved doing them. So I'll tell you a brief story. My... My meeting Paul was through a, a conversation about the fact that I did collect photographs of egg shapes. I, I didn't collect egg food things, but egg shapes because the egg for me was obviously very important in my profession. And so I wrote to Paul, I said, Paul, do you have any pictures of eggs? Have you ever produced them? Because I'm collecting images of eggs and have them by many other photographers. And, Paul at the time said, no, I don't really have any that I'm sure that I know about, but uh, you know, I was thinking about making one. And, and about, what, maybe three, four weeks later, I get this beautiful print. He says, if you like it, you can buy it. If you don't, don't worry about it. But, you know, and this is an incredible picture, a composition of black eggs uh, and a number of different things that have the same emotion that, that this still life does. And that was, it was like out of just bingo. He just did it. And it was, uh, it was a phenomenal, wonderful photograph, which I, I treasure immensely. So uh, that's my, my beginnings with Paul, is that if you want something to touch your heart, he can make it happen. I would, I would, I would say inspired by you. <laughs> Most of the photographs are either in bowls or set off here. Race with that and thought, where can we go? And bang, paint the egg black and put it on a white ground. <laughs> it, just, it just jumped into my head and I thought, do it. It jumped right out of your print too. Congratulations. <laughs> back uh, to this image before we go to the next one. Uh, basically, 
as I've been staring at it, there is this uh, generous contrast of light and dark and light and dark that keeps inviting the viewer, inviting me very much into the magic that this image creates in my very being. So the notion of still life normally has to do much more with a reflection of a particular time or society or way of life. Or Samuel Bach uses it as a description of the brokenness of the universe. This just speaks very strongly to the emotion of joy, of surprise, of just, um, the word comes to mind of enchantment. Um, and yet, Paul, they're very simple objects, but the artist in you arranges them in such a way that each individual who sees it has an opportunity to be engaged by that experience. So I would thank you, not in the way that Rusty did for making his eggs, but rather for creating this piece. If we can look to the next one, if that's okay. And like both Rusty and Paul to just respond to the creation of a negative print. Why a negative print? Right. Now the positive print, when I made it from the negative was not satisfying. I worked all day. I tried this paper. I tried that developer. I made darker prints, lighter. Nothing was working. I pulled the negative out of the environment, looked at it in the light, and there it was. This is a negative image. So I made a copy of the negative, which became a positive. Then when I printed it, the positive became a negative. And I love the fact that the light Boards out from behind all of that flower and it, it tr It's really amazing. Uh, what this, does this grayscale come into anything like this, or it just is what it is because of the way you make it? It just is what it is because the negative tends to feel as if the light is coming from behind and flowing outward. <clears throat> with, most, <clears throat> with most subjects, light is usually falling on the subject. In these negative images, the light is coming forward from it. Yeah. Yeah. This resonates for me with so many works in the canon of Western art, whether it's the Monet Garden, Angie Varni with flowers, but because of the luminosity that comes, as you just described, from the back of it then the branches, the leaves, the flowers themselves begin to dance across, in quotes, the canvas, or in this case, across the paper. And so there's a whole different dimension to at least people's, I think, and certainly my way of seeing and experiencing this particular image. And again, awakening in the viewer the capacity to revisit the way they look at the world around them. Um, and that is a connection that you're able to make by seeing with your heart, it seems to me, in a most effective way. The next image, if we can, I is also just, the Im image would, that we invited others to respond to, um, either as poem or by free verse, I think. One of the free verses amounted to a page and a half. So it was a little um, liberal free verse, but the winning, um, entry in this case was by Parrish Dobson and we've asked Rose to read the poem in response to it and then get both Paul and Rusty's reaction to the image. Yep so thank you to all of the people who um, sent in submissions it was a pleasure to read them um, but this one is based off of Reflecting Stream Reading, Connecticut. Still water inexpressible softness giving back to the trees their own loveliness. For this moment, there's a pause, a small dam pools, liquid and twilight. Further on the stream moves again through the darkening woods, a gently receding braid of water and light. How is it really that we can understand this world, every play of light a miracle, a going into air and night? I want that person's phone number. <laughs> That's the, the most wonderful response. <laughs> Obviously, the person is deeply involved in nature. With 
the words has flowed through his image from surface to back I would I would point out once again the motion in this, but it's as the poet has addressed, there's both a stillness and a motion in the same image. And it's a there's a just an incredible juxtaposition. The stillness can the stillness reflects the world around it, the trees, as she mentioned. Uh, the motion less reflective because it's in motion. But the but the juxtaposition of those two in this photograph are absolutely marvelous. Paul, you, you once told me the story about this photograph, how it got taken. I think it was like the last minute you were getting called to dinner. You want to tell us that short story? That's right. I was, it was the end of the day, lightning falling back. I was setting up the camera and I knew I had to work quickly. And my wife was screaming from the, from the cabin, come and have supper, stop what you're doing. And literally, I snapped the shutter and a second later, the light disappeared. Wow. The last light, which makes it magical, that the last light of the day it was given to me for this photograph. It's, it's true. You one of the miracles is that that gets preserved as a result of your art, and therefore others can be in that instant with you. The white running deer is a similar moment where if you didn't photograph it when you did, they're gone. Exactly. So that they're, they're both moments of organization and planning that go into many of the works, and they're moments that are simply meant to be. This is one of those moments in such a profound way and so beautiful. And it also makes me think of hanging it upside down, meaning that the light illuminating the trees from behind and the trees themselves in the mist as it is here. So the notion that reflection gives us a different reality is such a gift um, in so many wonderful ways. So very, very special. I have a few photographers and some friends. How did you make the photograph? Where were you standing? I said, well, very simple. I, I learned to stand on water. I was standing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. <laughs> no, that, there was that, some other guy that tried that trick. So we should go on to the next one. So this is, um, when I saw this, Paul, I thought music. I, I just thought music. To me, this is music in motion. And I, I don't know why, and I don't know whether it comes from music or not. It's obviously a reflection but the motion in this, the movement of this, and like a rondo, it's coming around and maybe it's going to get integrated again. And then there's some pizzicato in the front of it. I mean, it's just, I, it's some, if, you'd nail, if you said music, visual music, I would have, would have bought it. But this is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Visual music is a good way of expressing it. Uh, the clouds overhead were, they were still, but the water was moving. When the two came together, you got visual music. It really is, is, is a phenomenal. And again, I, I, I reiterated, I don't think anybody's going to miss it, but the motion is so valuable. Uh, and I think Bernie makes note of, you know, it, it's, it, there are these juxtapositions of things that because they're not simple for your brain to absorb, require that you think that you say well what is this and why is it and then as you enter it further there's the rewards the rewards of letting yourself go further in and exploring where it will tap into your to your heart if you get to that point but it, it the, the movement of this was just wonderful it's very simple but very emotional I'm glad i made it <laughs> I, I fell into that river after I made this photograph. Because I was right at the very end with my camera and I, I made the photograph and I was not very stable and the camera got away from me, fell in the water. I had, to, I had to go in and pull it out and set the camera on the bank. Minor White was close by and he said, 
I love it when a student gets into his work. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. I grab one more image. Do we? Yeah, we'll end with this one, which is on the cover of the catalog, which is a 1999 piece that I'm glad you included, Rusty, um, for a lot of reasons, well beyond the egg image itself, um, but rather because it has a luminosity um, that simply enlivens the viewer and certainly me in seeing it. What a joy to just be presented with an image like this and know that it, it exists in our lives and in our world. So this, this was the egg image that Paul had forgotten he'd made. So uh, when I, was to Paul, we, I, I said, Paul, here's some egg image. He said, oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. Yes. So I got the advantage of two egg, issues, egg images. This egg has an entire forest behind it. That's what pulled me there. I can see yeah. all the trees in the back. They're all out of focus. You can't see the trees. But that lens-like quality of the egg pulled the forest to me. So one of the one of the interesting things in this photograph is that because of the way the glass reflects the light or drives the light, everything's inverted. So as a camera lens inverts things, this lens inverts, so you got double inversion in a way, but when you print it, it comes out as just this. So the tops of the trees are at the bottom of the egg. And again, it's an image that draws you in um, to understand it, to the complexity of it. I mean, you look at the, those, uh, in some ways you see straight through it, in some ways you see a reflection that's, that's inverted. It's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty incredible image, but I, I think it is uh, maybe trite to say, but I think it is the eye of the photographer. It is I, all you see it. Um, and if you don't have that skill, it, it, it goes by as just something in the window. But for a trained eye, and, and as you said, it doesn't come easy. It's a lot of work. But for a trained eye, you see an image like this, you capture it. And then it's a giving for the rest of the world for, for a very long time. A, a trained eye and open heart and the realization that there's no end of surprises coming from me. Yeah. And I so, think, go ahead, Russell. Real quickly, someone had asked a little bit, Paul, about the, psych, I would say not the psychological, but, but the, the philosophical writings that the individuals that you felt may have influenced you as you explored your own interpersonal growth, uh, as well as your photography that may have been part of the work. Uh, did you want to speak to that just briefly? Very, very briefly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> as I said, I was not a very good student in school, all I did very little reading. I listened to great deal of music. I loved looking at nature. My report card, math, geography, history, B plus, C minus, art, A plus, music, A plus. There on my report card was a sense of myself. All the academic stuff, all of the you got to learn this, learn that. It was what would pour into me from the outer world. Sound and light is what really shaped me. The influence, well, you know, they talk a lot about influence. Our influence is incessant. So I recommend to my students that they carry a big shovel. Shovel it away. Let your influence rise up from within yourself. You can agree with one person or another. You can have sympathy. But I was a solitary person. My influences came from being that solitary. Only much later, I realized the writings of the uh, Egyptian mythologists that interest me. The Celtic mythologies, 
They're very poetic. They're very emotional. One photograph in the exhibition, it's called The Eye of Morris. Mm. It's about as intellectual as I have gotten in the still life. The Eye of Horus is an image very important to the Egyptians. It's the seeing eye, the single eye, or the Buddhists would call it the third eye. The Eye of Horus was an Egyptian mythological subject. And I thought, can I make an Eye of Horus? So I began to assemble pieces of this and that to construct a view, my view, or something akin to the eye of horror. Rose, let me sort of thank both Rusty and Paul for both their insights and their generosity, and maybe as usual to end with a quote from Thomas. Art is indeed a pursuit with no limits, like every other act of the spirit. And I think if nothing else, the show once again indicates that if we come with an openness of spirit, that there is much to nourish us and our spirit in these works. The insights both of Rusty's careful looking at the work and Paul's very beautiful and careful creating of the work is simply an invitation for all of us to spend time seeing with our eyes and with our heart. So it's with that that I thank everyone for joining us and hope that you enjoyed this as much as I did. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and to share. Thank you also Bert, for the opportunity to meet with Paul once again and to Paul, thank you so much for being open to the selection we made. Um, it, it was a wonderful experience and uh, one obviously I will never forget. Thank you. Thanks.